the subject for this morning is the apostolic structure for revival and harvest. And I, I'm not going to go all into it again last night, uh, as I did last night, but the, uh, the point is, uh, this is a revelation that God gave me because of two years of revival that were unprecedented in my lifetime. 1980 and 81, here in our building, in our services, we prayed through 1,585, uh, 1,585, 551 in 1980, 1,034 in 1981. This caused a lot of problems. Uh, traditionally, you'd try to rush and build a building, you don't rush and build a building to hold that many people. So how do you minister to these people? Well, that was the concern. So this lesson is, uh, is a revelation of God's principles. This is not a guide to how to apply those principles. We can answer questions about that, but nobody but Jesus can tell you exactly how to apply that in your life and ministry in your situation. As I've said already, tonight, tomorrow, during the day, and tomorrow night, each of our congregational elders, Antioch is a multiple congregation church, one church, multiple congregations. We have daughter works and all that other in addition, but we... We have three main congregations, and they function uh, not independently because there is one board of trustees, there's one set of legal documents, there's one set of bank accounts, uh, and there's one bishop. Uh, but they have the authority to lead and minister in each of their situations as the Lord would lead them to because of their situation. And you, if you compare them, some have been tempted to say, well, this is right, this is wrong. This is right, that's wrong. No. No. That's my call. God holds me accountable for making that call. It's my call. It's my responsibility to make that call. <laughs> Period. And what Central is doing? is right for Central. What North is doing is right for North. What West is doing is right for West. That's my call. And be careful that your opinions don't infringe into my area of responsibility because I don't want to be forced to defend my responsibility against your intrusion. He that hath ears to hear needs to hear. Right. So, the history of this revelation again is that we pray these people through. And the only thing I knew to do to try to take care of them was have church. And we were having four church services a week. Thursday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, every week. Those weren't special services. And almost all of those services, I taught in them. Now, of course, a lot of people take teaching to be some kind of dry, uh, boring thing. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> that's your problem. Since I have never been a preacher... I have been a teacher from the beginning. Um, I don't uh, consider what I do boring. <laughs> so, uh, I asked these questions last night, so I'd encourage you to watch that, that session, but I'm going to ask them concisely here right now. Uh, why aren't we having 
the results that we've been promised. I had a man of God call me. Oh, man, it may be 25 years ago now. Man of God, walk with God. Turns out he was a prophet, not a pastor, but that's another story altogether. But he was at that time pastoring. Of course, I said to him, what are you doing here? He said, pastor in church. I said, that's exactly why I asked the question, what are you doing here? We both know you're not a pastor. We both know you're a prophet. So why are you hiding here? Well, he's been pretty much an itinerant ministry uh, within a few years after that ever since. Of course, we know in the UPC, the only people that travel are evangelists. So that's our umbrella word for every type of ministry that doesn't have a church and travels from church to church. Find that in the Bible. Just saying. So, he called me. He said, Brother Wright, you've been here, and uh, yeah, you you know how spiritual this church is. Yep, it's a spiritual church. It's a praying church, worshiping church. He said, we have promises. I believe that. Why aren't they coming to pass? I said, you know what? It's nice talking to you, but we need to get off the phone. He said, no, I, 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 need, I, I need to answer this question. I said, you don't want the answer to that question. That's why I called. I said, no, I know that's why you think you called. But you don't want the answer to that question. Well, tell me anyway. Well, if I tell you, you're accountable for it. He said, tell me. I said, okay. I have a question for you. Let's suppose that this Sunday, 50 brand new sinners walked in your building, and every one of them got baptized and got the Holy Ghost. Tell me what your plan is in place to take care of all of them. Tell me what your plan is to be able to minister to them and disciple them. Tell me what your plan is to be able to expand the ministries of the church so that they have a place to get involved in in the kingdom as soon as you deem that they're ready. He said, you're right, I, I, I didn't really want to hear that. I said, I know, because we consider in our culture the work of the pastor is just to pray and study and preach good sermons or teach good lessons. What I, the answer to the questions I've asked you is a lot of work. Real work. Like consuming work. Work that you can't get out of your mind and spirit. So it was these questions <laughs> that uh, provoked me to be willing to hear from God something that completely changed my life and ministry and therefore this church in 1983. Because what I'd been taught only worked if you were praying through ones or fives and occasionally tens, but most of the people, have, if you pray through ten, are falling through the crack. Because we know in probably 75% or more of our church, the, most, the, the person that's most responsible for contacting and retaining new people is the pastor. And that works if it's ones and twos. Maybe it works with fives, even though some of them will fall through the crack. You let it be ten, and that guy's so overwhelmed, he doesn't know which end is up. Because we've not been taught and trained how to deal with that, and we don't have concepts that let us deal with that. Now, I, I have a question for you. <laughs> this is way ahead of the notes. Um, you know, we don't believe in biology anymore, and I'll just say that. <clears throat> Our culture doesn't believe in biology, but I believe in biology because it came from God. He's a creator. He created biology, right? Right. 
And part of biology is physiology, correct? So you can transition somebody by giving them what appears to be female mammary glands, but they don't function. They just look like it. You can't give somebody that wasn't born with a womb a functioning womb. You can't give someone that was born without male, is the word genitalia? Is that, is that uh, sophisticated enough to be able to say it in this kind of setting? You can't give someone by surgery male genitalia that works as God designed it. You can make it look like it, but it doesn't function. I had a pastor a couple of years ago when I was still district superintendent. He came to me with a problem. He said, Brother Wright, we have a hermaphrodite coming to our church. My wife had never heard the term before. We had to have a discussion after that. And, of course, you may or may not know that a maphrodite is someone that's born with what appears to be both male and and female genitalia. He said, is this person a male or a female? And I'm standing there going, oh, God, what do I say now? And he gave me the answer. I said, let me ask you a question. Is this person able to conceive a child? Or is this person able to beget a child? No, they have no ability to conceive. They can only impregnate. Then you're a male. They're male. Period. Period. That's it. If you can't get pregnant, but you can impregnate, you're male. In other words, you are what works in your body unless you have used non-God procedures to make it no longer function. But you can take away the function you were born with, but you can't add the function you weren't born with back to your body. Only the appearance of it. Okay, so November the 1st or 2nd, 1971, we had our first first child. Okay? Yeah. And uh, we bring him home. And uh, it wasn't hard to settle who was supposed to get up and feed the baby in the middle of the night. The one born with the equipment does that. The one born without the equipment doesn't. Now, you may get up and fellowship with the one born with the equipment while they do what they are supposed to do with that baby, but you can't participate. You don't have the equipment. Now, some idiot invented bottles. (laughs) <laughs> and it thwarted God's divine plan. <laughs> and I have used bottles <laughs> because I love my wife <laughs> and wanted to share in her burden. But from a biblical standpoint, the typical UPCI church has something like this. No matter who brings the person, no matter what their spirituality level is, their babies are confiscated and put in groups we call new converts. And either the pastor or some senior person bottle feeds them doctrine.
Well, the problem with that is it's been medically proven that it's not just the food that that newborn is receiving that's important. It's the bonding that takes place because of the individual holding they get. You want to talk about connection? That's where connection takes place. Whoever's feeding that new baby the sincere milk of the word is who they're connecting to. I mean, I'll tell you what happens. Female sheep, they get pregnant. Not by the shepherd. Shepherds aren't the father of sheep. Biblically, naturally, physiologically, in every principle of God, shepherds cannot father sheep. That's actually, there's a word for that. It's called bestiality, and it, and it doesn't work, but even though some have tried. So the problem then is, <laughs> there's a few of you, this is just a little bit too plain speaking for you. I'm talking out of the book. So, that you, not Y-O-U, but E-W-E, but pronounced the same, drops that lamb, and they usually, most shepherds and the owner of the sheep expects twins. Uh, if there's only one that's born, they usually feel that feel like that was a failed pregnancy because prof, from a profitability standpoint, they expect that you each of her seasons to produce at least twins. So, is there any shepherd that confiscates those lambs from the mother and tries to carry them all around and tries to figure out how to feed them and cut the mother out of it? No. But you have to grow people in God. You have to do what enables them to grow to whatever, at whatever pace they're willing to grow, to whatever degree they're willing to grow, so that they understand that it is their responsibility to be the mother sheep to the babies that are produced through them. It's not the shepherd's responsibility. In fact, that lamb doesn't plop out of the womb and go, Oh, who are, these, who are these, all these other sheep? And what is that weird looking thing up there in front of us? Why doesn't he have hair all over him? And why is he standing on his two back legs? Lambs don't do that. They don't even, they don't even consider all that. Lambs only have one goal in life in the beginning. Wherever the paps go, that's where they go. That's it. You don't have to close the back door when the people that are feeding the lambs follow the shepherd. Because the lambs are going to go where the one goes that feeds them. Now that's God's pattern. He's the creator. He's the one designed all of that. Why aren't we doing that? Why is it we have no, virtually, I'm speaking, generically speaking, I know their churches have different levels of this, but why is it that in tradition there is no structure for this? In fact, when we first came to Annapolis, one of the first elders that came to preach for us, he was an esteemed elder, someone I loved and respected. He said to me, quote, unquote, Brother Wright, don't trust saints. They'll split your church. So these people I'm praying through, I'm praying through enemies? I'm supposed to view these people with suspicion? That are out to undo what I'm giving my life to do? Why do I want to pray them through? Why do I want them to get saved? If they're only going to work against what I've been called here to do. Why do I want to do that? 
without being disrespectful, I didn't argue with him. I just listened. When he left, I dismissed that completely. Why? I wasn't raised in a preacher's home. I was a saint for the first 22 years of my life. It never crossed my mind to split a man's church. There's a, there's a principle. One of the main principles that I learned in four years at the Naval Academy. You don't put holes in the bottom of the ship that you're in. That's deep now right there. Okay. It was never on an exam, but everybody expects you to learn that one. You don't sabotage the ship that is the only thing keeping you alive because you can't see land anywhere. You're in the middle of the ocean. You don't sabotage that ship. And this man was telling me, don't trust the people that are getting saved because they'll sabotage your ship. They'll sabotage them the ship that's necessary to help get them to heaven. Then those people aren't saved. They're children of the devil. They're not children of God. Children of God don't sabotage the ship. Now, there are people that look like sheep that are wolves in sheep's clothing. Don't trust those, but you've got to have the discernment to know the difference between the sheep and those that just look like sheep. But aren't sheep. Well, I hate to tell you this. This is probably not the most encouraging thing you can hear if you're a pastor here. You only learn that one by trial and error. There's some you don't trust that you find out you should have. And there's some you do trust that you, you go, how did I do that? Why couldn't I have seen this? And, of course, the traditional approach for a shepherd is this is the expectation of a shepherd. You go collect everybody up that is not coming. Go get them. Collect them. So I was doing this. This one couple, boy, they were causing me trouble. They leave, and I go get them again. Talk them back into coming back. This happened four, five, six times. I don't remember. It was a lot. Then they end up causing me and the church major trouble. And I complained to God. He said, that's not on me. That's on you. I kept trying to move them out. You would let them go. You never asked me if you, I was supposed to go, you were supposed to go back and get them. You didn't ask me. Well, of course I didn't ask because everybody knows. It's the responsibility of the shepherd to go find all lost sheep. What if the ones God's moving out aren't sheep? They're wolves in sheep's clothing. What if he's sparing the flock by getting them out of there? He's supposed to go back and get the ones that are wolves in sheep clothing? It's a hard lesson, isn't it? It's a very painful, discouraging lesson. Because why is it that we have a tendency to invest so much in wolves and don't know they're wolves? <laughs> oh, God. So, there are certain keys to having an apostolic structure that can have and care for the coming end time worldwide apostolic revival and harvest. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. There's a, there's a very important principle to reading the Bible. God says what he means and means what he says. And in studying the Bible and rightly dividing the word, I know that you don't interpret any single verse separate from the rest of the Bible. That's when it says, 
no scriptures of any private interpretation. It's not talking about, well, you can't have your understanding and you can't have your understanding. Well, then who's supposed to have understanding? Private interpretation means no verse of the scripture can be interpreted separately and apart from all other verses of scripture. And that's how you know truth. Truth can't contradict truth. If there's a verse I think I understand, but there are other verses that clearly contradict that, and I can't harmonize those verses in my understanding where they're all saying the same thing, then I don't have a revelation of truth yet. I don't have it. Because truth can't contradict truth. In this verse, and there are so many verses that harmonize with this, he told them what to teach. And as I said last night, the verse the word for teach in Matthew 28, 19 is the word that means to make disciples. It's not just teaching. It's not just training. You have not taught and trained unless it's bringing people to the ultimate purpose of them becoming disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the other problem is, who defines what that is? We have to go to the Bible and read all the things that Jesus said a disciple is. Now, the Bible, Paul talked about the signs of an apostle. And Mark, in Mark 16 says, he tells us the signs of a believer. Well, I'm saying to you, there are signs of a disciple. And it's really easy to do. You just get this thing out called a program or an app, and you type the word in disciple, and I like to do disciple with the star sign. That means every form of the word with the word the word the words that spells disciple plus every other form of that should come up. And then all you have to do is just scroll down verse by verse and read those and see what Jesus said. A disciple is. And that's the goal. Now, to use the, a re relatively modern slang, not everybody's going to be willing to make that trip. Why? Why is that the case? Because we do not reap wheat. We reap sheaves. You don't go into the field and pick the grains of wheat off the stalks and put them in a basket. You can't harvest wheat like that. Or you can, but you can't make any money at it. And, of course, raising wheat is a, is a profit business because you feed yourself off of that you provide your seed for next year's crop off that, and then everything left over you sell for income to be able to buy the other stuff that you need. And God is in a profit-making business. And if you don't believe that, then you've never read the parable of the talents. God expects a return on his investment. And there's a whole lot of people, no matter how many talents they've got, that are doing what the one talent guy is doing. They just reserve it to themselves, and they produce nothing for the kingdom. Now, that guy was lost. Do you honestly think that a just God would tell us that he sent that guy to hell who did nothing with what he, God had invested in him. And then those of us that just attend church services and have done nothing for the Lord to use us to produce a profit for his kingdom, that he's going to save us? How can he do that? He's a righteous judge. He's a just God. You can't send somebody to hell for this and then save all these folks that are doing the exact same thing because they're faithfully attending a church service and they may look separated on the outside. They may pay their tithes, even in mint to Anderson Cumin. But 
But that doesn't make them saved. Because God saves disciples. Now, <laughs> I will say this. We humans want it all laid out. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so on. And so we can do a checklist. Okay, got done that, got this, done this, got this, got to work on that. Okay, okay. Oh, I made it. I got it. Hey, I'm there. You got three kids, right? What are their ages? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I am not going to comment on that. 23, 21, and 10. Now, the 10 year old, she, right? How many times does she feel like you guys have treated her unfairly because you won't let her do or give her what you give the other two? Yeah, yeah. So Sunday morning, you have good church. Somebody's never been there before, walks in, gets baptized, gets the Holy Ghost. You know they did. You, you know they did. You, it's all the evidences are there, not just the tongues, but the, the joy of the Lord. And it's just, it's there. They walk out of the building, drive down this hill, get on that four-lane highway, and some drunk person coming down the wrong lane hits them head on, and they're killed. Are they saved? Yeah. Because God is sophisticated enough. And he has enough, he judges hearts, and he judges that one day old who dies different than that person that's been here two years, different than the person that's been here five years, different than the person that's been here 10 years, different than the person that's been here 50 years. You can't lay out an exact to-do list and to not don't do list and apply it to every one of those people because every one of them are, are, are in God's, from God's perspective, for each one of them, him knowing them, where they come from, what's in their heart, he has a, he has a road map and that with all of his mercy and grace, he expects that if they let him, they will arrive at this, this point in this place in their life, they'll arrive at this point in this place in their life, and, and if they are arriving at those places, they're saved. If they're stuck back here at the beginning, they may be so sweet, they bring the pastor's family food already prepared every Sunday. Or maybe they're so sweet, they wash your car couple of times a week. Or maybe they mow your grass, which all of that's very southern. It's hard to believe somebody that's that sweet to the pastor and his family is going to hell. You can't, you don't go to hell, heaven because of how sweet you are to the pastor's family. It's whether or not you're a disciple. What kind of progress are you making on the journey of discipleship? We have some churches that are trying to grow a church with spiritual newborns, trying to get talk spiritual newborns into getting pregnant and having spiritual children. Eh. Wrong answer. I don't know when this started, but, you know, you open Google, and now they have all these, I don't maybe not on yours, but all these different articles or something, different subjects from other different sources. I don't know if this is true or not, but there was this one article on Google's main page about this six-year-old girl that had a baby. Now, obviously, somebody molested her. And she survived the child's birth. 
But as that child grew up, uh, there were things in their body that wasn't right because of being birthed from a body that was not mature enough to, to, to contribute to the process properly. And that, that child, I think, he was, I think he made it to 10, but the doctors diagnosed that he had all kind of deficiencies in his body, his bone structure and everything. And so <laughs> we, we know something. We know that the people that bring the most visitors to church are new people. So we, we, we have all done that. We've ridden that horse. Woo, friend. Why? Because those folks that's been around a while, they've lost all that. They don't have that anymore. You can't get them inspired to do anything. You're just happy to see they showed up. And if the offering plate goes by and they actually put something in it, you go, Whew, that's, that's even a plus. You don't recount on them. You don't rely on them. You, you, you know, you know they're not going to be involved with anything involving the lost or anything. They're there to fulfill their obligation, their Sunday morning obligation, because they're Catholic Pentecostals. And, uh, and so they, they fulfill their obligation, and that's it. That's all you can get out of them. They're just a body, warm body in the crowd. And so what do you do? Those brand new ones that's got zeal, we ride that horse. And they're not mature enough to birth babies I know I know I know I know and I'm acknowledging to you willingly that this stuff I'm teaching you I learned over a lifetime and that nobody sitting here or listening to this that's going to get this in this couple of hours of teaching. You just not. It's not. The only thing I've, I've learned, that the only thing I can expect is that in good ground, God's going to plant this good seed, and over a period of time, that good seed is going to grow up and produce results for his kingdom. Because... Some of this stuff, it took me years to learn, and he had to beat it in this thick skull of mine. And I neither have the authority nor the desire to beat it into your skull because it's not going to work anyway. That's why I'm saying to you, this is just seed. Now, God is the one that controls the process. And if you're hungry, he can speed the process up. It, I mean, I can't even imagine from back when I was in high school taking college courses at the same time. But that's becoming more and more common. I mean, kids getting their high school diploma on one day of a week and go and get their college degree on another day. You go, how did they do that? Well, first of all, did they have a life outside of books? That's not my call. If that's what that's that's what they want to do, that's between them and God and their parents and whatever. Of course, that's right. Parents don't have any rights with anything anymore. So, <sighs> praise God, Hallelujah, glory to God, Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Because <laughs> once you take your skid, kids to school, your opinion is absolutely of no importance. In fact. If you voice it, you are a horrible person. So we're supposed to pay the bills so they can make our kids what they think they ought to be. And if we disagree with that, I'm not surprised at the parents that are rising up. I'm shocked at all the other parents 
that are saying nothing about it. Of course, I realize they're trying to intimidate, but if you get enough that are raising their voice up, you can't intimidate a crowd. You can intimidate a few people, but you can't intimidate a crowd. The arrogancy that you know what's best for my kids. They're not doing what's best for your kids. They're indoctrinating your kids to do what's best for their agenda. And while you still have a choice, you might find need to find some other way to educate your children because the day will come they're going to eliminate all those choices. I said the day will come they're going to eliminate all those choices. And if you don't abide by their choices, they're going to confiscate your children because not abiding by their choices will be judged, legally judged to be child abuse. It's already happening and it's going to become prevalent and then finally predominant. I don't mean to be offensive and I don't have a clue who's watching this by Zoom or who may watch these recordings. Jesus said, work while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And if we continue to just sit back and propagate by our blind continuance in doing things that aren't working, but they just work for us in fulfilling our obligation. We're going to pay a high price when darkness comes. And I know, I know, I get it. I believe in pre-tribulation rapture too. But we have to di discern the difference between the, the, the wrath of man persecution that God is going to allow to come on the church before the rapture and the wrath of God that will happen during the seven years after the rapture and people don't equate they equate those two rather than discerning the difference between them I'm not a negative person I'm not a fearful person. I'm not. You don't say this stuff if you're fearful. <laughs> you don't. Now, it's not being streamed. That's because I, I was told not to stream it. Bottom line is this. If he told me to stream it, it'd be streamed. Whatever happens. So, <laughs> the scripture commands us to go make disciples. And the subject matter that's necessary to teach, to make disciples, is teach them to obey Everything that he taught us. I've said it. I will say it again. I am not. I'm not preaching against having a church building. I'm not preaching against having what we call church services. I'm not preaching against that. If, he, if he's allowed to be in charge, call it. I don't care what you call it. I don't care what it looks like. If he's in charge, you're obeying him, whatever he wants to do, I'm not, that's not my business. But he said, the purpose of the church is to teach those that have believed and have been baptized until they become his disciples. And what are we supposed to teach them? Everything that he taught the apostles, he commanded the apostles to teach us. 
That's what we're supposed to teach. And I said this last night also, but in order to move along as quickly as possible, in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 41, every verse, every one of those 41 verses is speaking specifically of what took place on the day of Pentecost. The first verse that wasn't doing that is Acts 2.42. And Acts 2.42 is the first verse in all of the Bible that lets us know exactly what the church was like, what it was doing, what it was focusing on after the day of Pentecost. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, verse 42, and in breaking of bread and in prayers, and fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. That's what they did in Jerusalem. You won't find that taught anywhere outside of Jerusalem, but the church was only in Jerusalem at the time. Why was that taught? Because persecution was coming. And they weren't going to be able to keep it anyway. Verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple. And breaking bread from house to house. Did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So Acts 2 starts out with they were all in one accord in one place. Acts 2 ends up with they were all together in gladness and singleness of heart. How? They continued steadfastly. The word in the Greek that's translated by the English words continued steadfastly automatically implies something. It implies this, this, that they'd been doing these things before. And they were now continuing in them. Well, how does that fit? He told them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So if they were continuing steadfastly in the very first verse after the church came into existence that tells us what the church focused on and what the church was doing going forward and they were continuing in something, it means they were already doing these things to some degree. Who introduced those things to them? Who taught them those things? How did they know to do those four things? And uh, <laughs> that's key, okay? These four aspects of the early church are the keys to apostolic revival. They continued steadfastly in being taught by the apostles and in faithfully following what the apostles taught. The Greek word translated fellowship is the same Greek word that is translated communion. Therefore, the early church carefully continued to fellowship with one another spiritually. They not only participated in the Lord's Supper, but they joined together regularly for spiritual fellowship. This word also connotes that they looked out for one another spiritually. We'll get more into that later, possibly. It'll be in the notes at least if you want to study them. Breaking of bread from house to house, according to verse 46, this means that they spent time together naturally. So the word fellowship here is separated from eating together. In Pentecost, we've joined the two together and defined that as fellowship. In Pentecost, that I was raised in for 77 years now, if we eat together, we call that fellowship. Biblically, the two are not equal. Why? It's two different types of connection, two different types of bonding, two different types of fellowship. And it is. That's, uh, I'm going to use a word. I, I, I'm a little reluctant to use it, but I'm using it. There is something almost mystical 
about sitting down together with people and eating the same food together. There's something that happens on a much deeper level than simply hunger being satisfied. Eating together with people is so frequently used in Jesus' ministry, it's amazing. And of course, back way back then, uh, the great, 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 great majority of people didn't have anybody that were paid on staff to cook for them. So usually somebody in the family had to do the cooking. So if, you, if you're welcoming guests into your home, somebody's got to do a lot of work to do that. And that's why the scripture says that, uh, is that the bishop or the elder must be given to hospitality. Well, it's just not my personality. We just don't like to be around people. Then you're not called. I mean, because <laughs> you want to see my personality tests? It's not about my personality. It's about my calling. I have to spend time with people. And I'm very jealous of my alone time with the Lord. And my wife accuses me sometimes of being able to sit here in this house by yourself all day. Yeah. And <laughs> that's a problem. Why? Because <laughs> I'm not most of the time, every once in a while, there's enough flesh here I can get carnal but you know and just well the older I get some of the time I fall asleep <laughs> last night I'm right laying in bed reading and I was a, I didn't know I was asleep I was holding my iPad I, I felt this elbow you're asleep Put the iPad up. What? I'm awake now. I put the iPad away and tried to go back to sleep. I didn't go back to sleep as easy as I went while I was holding it. Same thing in my recliner. I could be sitting there studying and fall asleep. I lay the iPad down. I'm awake. So I have to pick it up and hold it so I can go back to sleep, I guess. But the point I'm making is this, you know. This lady sitting back here it, for 55 years now, as of next week. Wednesday is of next week. is 55 years since the day we met. Is the best friend I have in the whole world. Now, Jesus is more my friend than she is, but she's it. She's been it for 55 years. As much as I love her. My time with the Lord is very precious to me. And I know some folks, they, they have their discipline. They get up and pray at a certain time. And I learned the hard way that if he dares to wake me up before then, he doesn't want me to say, Lord, I still got an hour. Oh, yeah. That didn't work. So, for those, it's a, it's a process of maturity. And if you're not going to pray, then you better have a, a time you're committed to to pray. But once you have, by, it's called temperance, it's, Temperance is not self-discipline. Self-discipline is an oxymoron. Because the word discipline means to come under the authority of another. Self cannot discipline self. Impossible. And I know there are folks who will argue with me about that. I'm not going to get off in that, but I'm telling you right now, 
The problem is, <laughs> the problem is, there's something else disciplining you other than self when you accomplish discipline. And it's not the spirit of temperance that is empowering you to be disciplined. So it's either the spirit of temp temperance, the fruit of the spirit of temperance that's dis disciplining you, or it's some other spirit. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's enough of that. So. so, but anyway. If he wakes me up at three, and usually he wakes me up talking to me, and so I've learned to get up, and write that down. I thought, you're not getting up to pray? Well, your definition of prayer in the Bible is a little different. Biblical prayer is not one-way communication. Some of the greatest prayer meetings and times of fellowship I've ever had, I did very little talking, just listening. You know, I don't know how women live with us men because we really are pretty dense. I'm seriously, I, I don't know why God made us like this. Why? That's why when I was a kid, I thought all dogs were males and all cats were females I, I, because the difference between the two reminded me of men and women. I was so disillusioned when I found out there were female dogs and male cats. I just didn't work in my brain. Right. So. <laughs> Women just, they don't tell you. I want to believe they don't know what to tell you. But they don't explain stuff to you. I, I, I want to be able to understand what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. I, just because it's not good enough for me, I, it just doesn't work like that. So I'm a fixer, right? So for years, she would tell me what was going on to whatever degree she chose. And, of course, what I tried to do was fix it. Uh, and that she'd get upset. Huh? Weren't you giving me a list of things to do and I'm trying to address those things. I learned that if it was hanging a picture, do. If she's telling feelings, shut up and listen. She's not telling you to do something. You're doing it just by listening. What? Yeah. Yeah. I don't even want to tell you how long it took to learn that. It took a, whoo, that can make you feel dumb really, really, really quick. Understand how long it took to learn, learn that. You know, when God in t designed this and intended that we live one man, one woman for the, our entire lives, cons considering that our mate doesn't die. Do you know how different he had to make women to keep men from getting bored? Because younger men don't understand anyone that thinks differently than they do. Males have their priorities they have the, the way they think whatever and so you know you start out with what's wrong with this woman doesn't she know how to think oh she knows how to think all right just not like you buddy <laughs> uh, just not like you 
That's why, to the best of my ability through God, I try to grow somehow as a husband every day. Now, I am so far, the more I grow, the farther the destination seems. I'm serious. It's, just, it's not what she does. The more I think I learn, the more I think I grow, I don't feel closer to where I'm trying to arrive. All that does is prove how much farther I've got to go. So, therefore, there's no reason to get bored after 55 years. Oh, Lord, here's a word. This, is not, this isn't in the notes, and this isn't in the syllabus. I'm just saying this for a couple of you. The Lord gave each of us married brethren, wives who are exactly what we need to keep us challenged every day. Because if we weren't challenged, we would get bored, complacent, and go on to the next thing. I don't say next woman, but the next thing. And I'll tell you, why am I saying all this? Somebody needs to hear this, I guess. But the thing's so amazing to me. We've been married 10 years, and the Lord just... He says to me, your wife is like a rose bud that has not bloomed. And I have made you her greenhouse. And it is your responsibility to provide her a place of emotional safety in which she can blossom. And my first reaction, of course, was, huh? What? But it's true. Now, does, he didn't tell me how to be a greenhouse. <laughs> she didn't tell me how to be a greenhouse. He's teaching me how to be a greenhouse, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. That's why there's no way to graduate. It cracks me up, this marriage seminar stuff. I know it helps to some degree, but to me, the only way I could listen to somebody do a marriage seminar is if they say up front, I am not an expert. There is no expert on Mary. I'm still in the process of learning. I will share with you what I've learned so far. If they don't start like that, the off switch on my receiver just turned off. No, thank you. Not interested. I don't care who you are. I don't care how many degrees you've got and all that other stuff. I don't care. I really don't care. I mean, I got 55 years of experience, and hopefully my wife would agree that I've applied myself to trying to learn, but I'm reminded every day, and I won't go into that, not by her, but by my own eyes, I'm reminded every day how far I am from being the husband I'd like to be. So, that was just a commercial break, I guess. I don't know. Not a commercial, but just to let your mind think of something else. All right? Finally, of the four is prayers. And we think this, well, prayer. Well, of course, everybody prays. No. They continued in prayers together. They didn't just pray privately. They prayed together. Why is that important? 
because every one of us individually are sons of God, whether male or female. Every one of us collectively, whether male or female, are a part of the bride of Christ. Sons are not intimate, intimate with God. No matter how close the relationship, it's not intimacy. That is not a word you can use for a relationship between a man and son in a positive fashion. So husbands and wives are intimate. Fathers and sons are not. When I pray by myself or you pray by yourself, male or female, you can only pray as a child of God. But when two or three of us gather together and pray, if two of us agree as touching anything on earth, we'll have it of our Father which is in heaven. Why? Because when at least two of us come together, we're not praying as sons anymore. We're now praying as bride. And this is what this verse is talking about. They continued in prayer together. And of course, over the years, one of the most important things that we do in our small group meetings, regardless of what it's called in any of the congregations, is we pray, and we pray together, and we pray one for another. The Bible says for us to pray one for another, bearing one another's burdens. And any small group meeting that comes together consistently without praying one for another is not an apostolic small group. It's not. An apostolic small group, one of the foundational principles of an apostolic small group is we pray one for another. We bear one another's burdens. Praise God. Too many of today's one is Pentecostals who consider themselves apostolics, but only from a traditional perspective. Uh, many of today's uh, one is Pentecostals have stopped with doctrine and some kind of prayer while essentially ignoring the middle two of these New Testament practices. If we're going to have apostolic revival and harvest, we have to participate in all four of these now here's the principle this is the principle this is so clearly laid out by Paul that it's just it's irrefutable except by those who are just looking for some verses to excuse them for what they're not doing Hebrews chapter 5 beginning with verse 11 uh, and I didn't put that in my notes, so I'll wait on you on the computer screen. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Paul said, uh, and you can read the, be the beginning of that chapter to see what he's talking about. I've got some deep things I want to say to you, but I can't say them. Because you don't have the ability to hear them. And then he tells us why they didn't have the ability to hear them. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead work in a faith toward God of, doctrine, uh, the, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on a, of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment, and this will we do if God permit." Let's read that in the Amplified. I'm assuming you're able to do that on the screen up there. Uh, Amplified, Hebrews 5.11. Concerning this, we have much to say, which is hard to explain, since you have become dull in your spiritual hearing and sluggish, even slothful in achieving spiritual insight. For even though by this time you ought to be teaching others, 
You actually need someone to teach you over again the very first principles of God's word. You have come to need milk, not solid food. This is the word of God. So those people sitting out there that you see every Sunday, are they actively involved in teaching somebody the word of God? If they're not, they're spiritually immature. I don't care how long they've had the Holy Ghost. Because Paul's singular indicator of someone becoming spiritually mature is they're teaching others what they've been taught. And anybody that's not teaching others is still spiritually immature. I don't, know what, I don't care what their name is, how much money they make, how much they give. I don't care. I don't care. Point blank period. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Now, the entire book of Hebrews is written to all of the church. But I've heard preachers try to take this one passage and say it's only referring to preachers. The, la the, the indication of the lack of spiritual integrity in attempting to do that is beyond comprehension. Lie to yourself much? It's, I mean, because I either lie to myself or acknowledge that I've been doing everything I was taught to do, but it's not working because it's not producing teachers of the word. Well, I'm not really gifted to be a Bible study teacher. Seriously. I'm not a cook either. But if I didn't have anybody to prepare me food, I'd figure out some way to survive. Yeah. It might be PBJs. But I'm going to live. Okay. I mean, there's no comparison between her cooking and my cooking. None. I had, to, I had to prepare a whole meal to get my cooking merit badge when I was a Boy Scout. I did it. I, I didn't continue cooking after that. <laughs> I made chocolate cake. I did this by myself at home. My mother was not there. And I, because I, I, it's my merit badge, I've got to do this, not her do it for me. So I, I did all this food and I made a chocolate cake and vanilla cake with chocolate icing. And I made the icing from scratch from the recipe, whatever. And I misread the percentage of salt that went in it. And I, I'm really partial to chocolate. Yeah. This is definitely chocolate. And uh, result of at least so. At least partially, uh, maybe a good part. I really restrained myself today. Uh, I, uh, my wife laid a double Snick Snickers bar on the with almonds on my desk this morning, and I thought, you know, I'm going to be going a while. I may get hungry. I may take that with me just to get me a little bite of energy while I'm going. And, I thought, no, I better not do that. I'll save that for later. So I threw the whole cake away. My mother comes home and says, I thought you were going to make a cake. I did, but the chocolate was too salty. What would you do? I threw it away. She said, we could have scraped the icing off. Well, I'm not eating it now out of the trash can, so, so be it. But she signed off anyway so I could get my merit badge. But... <laughs> Oh, I get off the who oh, and did it that time. When I get off on that and I can't pick right back up on the direction I was going, then I got a little bit of flesh in there somewhere. So, because flow doesn't stop no matter the story, if that's what I was supposed to do. So, in Jesus' name, forgive me. So, <laughs> one more time from the Amplified, verse 12. 
For even though by this time you ought to be teaching others, you actually need someone to teach you over again the very first principles of God's Word. You have come to need milk, not solid food. For everyone who continues to feed on milk is obviously inexperienced and unskillful in the doctrine of righteousness, of conformity to the divine will in purpose, thought, and action. For he is a mere infant not able to talk yet, no matter how long they've had the Holy Ghost. But solid food is for grown men, for those whose senses and mental faculties are trained by practice to discriminate and distinguish between what is morally good and noble and what is evil and contrary to either divine law or human law. Therefore, let us go on. The word therefore is a conjunction. It is a conclusive conjunction that ties the previous four verses I've read, to what's about to be said. If you separate the two, you don't get the impact of the message. Therefore, therefore, I can't quote the Amplified, so I have to read it. Therefore, let us go on and get past the elementary stage in the teachings and doctrines of Christ, the Messiah, advancing steadily toward the completeness and perfection that belong to spiritually to spiritual maturity. Let us not again be laying the foundation of repentance and abandonment of dead works, dead formalism, and of the and of the faith by which you turn to God. Now, this is where the Amplified is. It, this is not right. It's not in the original Greek that they just didn't want to talk about water baptism here. That's why this is not a divinely inspired translation, is it? With teachings about purifying, the laying on of hands, the resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment and punishment. These are all matters of which you should have been fully aware long, long ago. Listen to this. If indeed God permits, we will now proceed to advanced teaching. What's the problem with advanced teaching? For those that are only there, if you can entertain them enough to hold them, you lose them. So I said to a pastor the other day, he was asking, I said, well, uh, do you really want to hear this? Yeah. I said, then you don't do this advanced teaching in Sunday morning or Sunday night if you still do that or even Wednesday night. This is teaching you do to a called crowd. And you don't call the crowd. You let them call themselves. You have separate times of teaching where you go into the depth of stuff and you make it optional and you teach those that are there. Why is it that doesn't sound very inviting? Because in our heart of hearts, we know how few will show up. And hear me, the only ones that, the ones that show up are the only ones that are growing. And just coming to church and trying to do the do's, not doing the don'ts, and paying your tithes and looking separated. Eh. You can't support that biblically at all. That's called religion. When you're practicing, oh God, when you're practicing faithful church attendance and trying to be a good person and, and contributing to the church and at least looking outwardly like you are somewhat committed that's called religion. Now, all of those things have a biblical basis in their place. But those things don't define salvation. They don't. Paul said we must progress beyond our doctrine. Why? Because our doctrine is our foundation. 
The principles of the doctrine of Christ are the foundation. You don't, pour, you don't dig footers and pour a slab and stop there. And far too many oneness churches have pinched man-made tents on God's slab. Because we didn't go beyond the foundation. We're not supposed to renounce or abandon the foundation. We're supposed to do what you're supposed to do with the foundation, and that's build on it. The scripture says that we are God's building. That word is specifically used. We're his building. Now, trust me, when we first built this building, this, the, all of it, well, what it was, this is the first real major construction project I was ever involved in. I had no idea the amount of time it took to dig footers and pour them and pour slab. I had no idea. I thought that was just a matter of days. I didn't know that it would take probably close to as much time or at least a third of the time to get all that in right. I said, Man, once you get the slab done, you got a good crew out there. They can put that structure up like in no time. And you do, they're doing all this work and digging. It, you're just digging holes, putting concrete in it. No, it's not digging holes, putting concrete in it. Now, we don't do it like they used to do it. Used to, they had a cornerstone that was the first thing that was laid. That's not a keystone. A keystone is that last stone that's in an, a stone arch that holds it all together. All the pressure's on the keystone. A keystone and a cornerstone's not the same thing. In a cornerstone, the cornerstone is the first thing set. In all the building, the cornerstone's the first thing set. And it is very carefully set and situated because the whole building is built from the cornerstone. The cornerstone, from the cornerstone, the original two uh, foundational walls go out. If the cornerstone is not set right, the building's not going to end up right. So the first thing that's laid is the cornerstone. From that, the found, all the foundation is put in. And then once you got all that put in, then comes the structure. And that cornerstone is Christ, of course. The entire foundation is the principles of the doctrine of Christ. The Lord doesn't stop there, but we have. And so many church services in our buildings are either restating what the foundation is, repeating what the foundation is. That's, yes, that's the same thing. Uh, making sure everybody has heard the foundation again. Over and over and over again. You know why we do that? Because we know there are people sitting there that haven't got it. And why we just continually repeat the same stuff that they are not receiving. Those that have received it aren't getting what they need to grow beyond it. Why? Because we pastors have this traditional expectation. We want everybody involved. And so if you can't get everybody to a Sunday night service, you just cancel the service. Really? Seriously? <laughs> oh, my. Never ceases to amaze me. The very verse that's the only verse that people use when I talk about the fact we're not a church service-based culture biblically which, of course, traditionally we are, but biblically we're not. They want to quote Hebrews 10, 25, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. I believe that, but you don't. Because if you believe that's talking about church services, it says, uh, and so much the more so as you see the day approaching. So if you believe that verse is talking about church services, how many church services do you have in a week now? Because you can't interpret that verse within our tradition and say that verse applies to church services and then be having fewer services. You don't get to pick and choose which part of the verse you want to consider and apply. It's all or nothing. Of course, with God it's all, but 
with tradition, not so much. <laughs> oh my, I repeat, you're welcome to stand. The Greek word is translated perfection here has several meanings. We're going to progress beyond doctrine, which is our foundation. We're going to progress toward perfection or the word that means the finished product of a process. <laughs> the finished product of a process. Let's see. What we're involved in is a supernatural process as specified by the Word of God. It's a process, a biblical process that's, that's done supernaturally. And the goal is to get to the finished product of the process. The word also means the end of a goal being in view. It also means... This is the Greek definition, completeness, maturity, fruitfulness. So when people are led beyond spiritual immaturity, as Paul specified in the last three verses of Hebrews 5, and in verse 6, which is connected by the conjunction the conclusive conjunction, therefore, he is saying that the end goal is for them to grow up and the, become mature, and the proof that they become mature is they are fruitful. Again, the foundation of the church has already been laid he, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, for we are laborers together. You're God's husbandry, you're God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, another build it thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Christ Jesus. A complimentary verse to that is Ephesians 2, verse 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. I thought, well, here it is. Are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. What prophets? We know who the apostles are. What prophets? In this case, it's not talking about New Testament prophets. In this case, it's talking about the Old Testament. So, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, and it's built upon the foundation of the Old Testament and the New Testament. In whom all the building is fitly framed together, Groweth into a holy temple of, in the Lord. This is, I love this verse. Oh, I love all of them, but this is this. In whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, I have a question. Does anybody here have a building? That's going to heaven. Is anybody here trying to build a building that's going to go to heaven? Why would I ask such a ridiculous question? Because the church is going to heaven. And anything you call the church, you're implying that's going to heaven. Now, the old timers used the phraseology, the church house. I, I guess I wouldn't have a problem with that. But if the body collects out under a tree, that's the church of God. That's the house of God. 
we're built up as a habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, you may not like that right now. That's okay. But the day's coming that you'll see that you can have a gathering any place that you can gather people safely. And if you're not open to this concept, because a church building, you've got to have a church for us to get together in, then you just gave all the power to the enemy, figuratively speaking, because if he can shut down your use of a building, he shut down the church. And that was all the, the, oh, the wailing. How could God let the church be shut down? He did it. He didn't shut down the church. He only allowed to be shut down that those that don't, don't know how to do anything different than something in a building. But I'm trying to be unkind. I'm trying to get you to think. And I, this is not a, an unkind statement. It's just a fact. I got 77 years of experience with that fact. Thinking is not, is, is not exactly encouraged uh, in one is Pentecostalism. Blind obedience is, you do what I say because I say do it because I'm the man, I'm the Pope, I'm the little Pope. You do what I say. Well, I don't like you calling me the little Pope. Then quit acting like one. Peter specifically said for us not to be lords over his heritage. That's what the Pope is. He's the Lord over his heritage. Dominion. Oh, Lord. Now, you, 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 whether you're sitting here or you're watching this now or in the future, you got to get this. I don't have to prove any of this. You don't have to believe it. But there will be a day you'll try to find this so you can watch it again because you're going to need some direction. Because there will be a day that what you've been trying to make work is not going to be allowed to work anymore. It's okay. I got time. I don't have to prove this to anybody. I said from the beginning, last night, today, we are not here to convince you to change. We're just trying to prepare you and make available direction so that when you don't have any choice but change, you've got some direction. Because back in March of 2020, a whole lot of people were panicked because they didn't have a clue what to do. Well, that's what this is about. This is about providing direction for the future. Now, again, if you have faith like Moses, like Moses, like Noah, you begin to prepare even though you don't see it yet. Because it's coming. I mean, you can't read the prophecies of Jesus without believing it's coming. Now, you may want to believe that it's some far distance off, but, of course, Jesus said, if, if, if the servant says, my Lord is going to delay his coming, that doesn't encourage you to get closer to God. That encourages you to live your way. That's what he said. Read it. That's a paraphrase, but it's there. So when we realize that God is speaking things we haven't seen yet, and he's speaking those things out of love so that if we have faith, we will begin to pray for them, pray, pray for them because he's saying it to us. That's good. But if we won't hear the word before we need to, are we really going to hear the word when we have to? Because you can't suddenly decide this needs to be done and snap your fingers and make all these people what they need to be, that you had time to get them there if you would have just believed and obeyed God. 
So what does it mean? It's still going to be scattered. You know, the devil's always known this. You take out the head guy, everything else is going to scatter. So the, the normal everyday disciple, if I can be so crass, they don't really, they're not really in the same place of jeopardy as the little pope and every, all other leaders. Because the devil knows if all those people's relationship with God is dependent on hearing what you have to say about God rather than you teaching them how to hear for God from God for themselves and how to study and understand the Scripture for themselves, all he has to do is take you out. He doesn't have to kill you. He's put you in jail where you can't communicate. Smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Unless the sheep have been trained to be able to minister to each other, one another, in an emergency. Oh, Lord. You'll have to read this. I'm skipping over. Where does the scripture talk about small group ministry the first time? Okay. I said it already. The family of Jacob went down into Egypt 400 plus years later. The nation of Israel came out. Depending on who's counting, uh, there was either 74 or 75 that went into Egypt. Uh, if you want to count Joseph and his wife and the two sons, they were already there. They came out between two and four million. Or where would you come up with that number? The army of Israel was 600,000. The fighting age of those in Scripture was between 20 and 50. You weren't allowed to fight typically uh, before 20, and you weren't expected to fight after 50. Those were not only fighting men, but they were rare, very, very rarely were they not also married men with families. So depending on how you wanted to multiply that 600,000, not counting everybody under 20, not counting everybody over 50, depending on how you want to multiply it by the typical today uh, mother, father, and 2.5 kids, that's 4.5 times 600,000. Or they also obviously had a lot more kids. And depending on how long the couple had been married, maybe they're 20, because actually biblically it says specifically that someone who is first married cannot go to war for the first year. Uh, that's a couple of reasons because they expect you to get your wife and the family way so that your name is continued and she has someone to take, grow up to take care of her in case you get killed in battle. But it's also because they don't want somebody distracted by that first year of marriage out there standing beside you. You're counting on that guy to help stay, keep you alive, you keep him alive. You don't want him standing there thinking about his wife at home so that they were not allowed to go fight. So depending on what factor you multiply 600,000 by, it's easy to see how you could come up with as many as 400,000, 4 million people. Now, there's other ways to come up with a number, but that's the simplest way in my, from my personal study, and I'm not taking a position. Uh, that's why I usually say between 2 and 4 million. <laughs> Does it really matter? When God establishes a principle, he always establishes it at its farthest extreme. He establishes it from a, from a dimension that most will never have to experience. So when he wanted to prove what the Holy Ghost could do for us, what is the one thing he did to prove we'd receive the Holy Ghost? 
he tamed the most unruly member from the moment you fully receive the Holy Ghost. He went to the extreme because if you can tame your tongue, you can tame your whole body. So his ability to tame your tongue proves his ability to tame your whole being from the moment you got the Holy Ghost. So since Jacob went down to Egypt with his family and the nation of Israel came out of, well, they weren't, yeah, they were called Israel, sorry. The nation of Israel came out of Egypt and it was God's first congregation. Well, now he is trying to clearly establish to us his plan and pattern for having a congregation. A congregation bigger than any of us can believe for. A lot of folks out there have claimed it. But they haven't got this far. So listen to this. Exodus 18, beginning with verse 14. And when Moses' father-in-law saw, okay, so Moses left his wife and kids with his, her father uh, and went to Egypt to set all his people free. And so now they've come out, they've come out of Egypt, Red Sea and all that. Now they're free. And uh, so, Mo, uh, so Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, comes with Moses' wife and his two kids to bring them back to Moses. And you can read all of that in the first 13 verses of, of Exodus 18. But I'm starting down with verse 14. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people. Uh, let's go on the screen here a minute. Let's, let's try verse 12. Sorry. Just to, we, need, we need a little bit more background. Exodus 18, 12. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. And it came to pass on the morrow. I needed to have included this verse. It came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did, notice this word. Little word, just two letters. All that he did what? To the people. Now, he thought he was doing this for the people. But Jethro, even though he was not a Hebrew, the Bible calls him a prophet of God. And he commands Moses, the man, the man in charge of four million, to do some stuff, you'll see. So he had to have some authority in God, and he quotes God, and he says to Moses, what is this thing you're doing to the people? Why? He was a typical Pentecostal pastor with a list of appointments for counseling as long as from your fingertip to your shoulder. This is our job, not according to Jethro. No wonder guys get burnt out. What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thyself? What? Why sittest thyself as a little pope? I'm sorry, I can't. I've never, I've never used that before, and I'm just kind of infatuated with it a little bit. I, I'm just kind of working on that one really good. <laughs> oh. If whoever you are out there that was upset over me saying that would just calm down, I wouldn't be picking up on it and keep saying it. I'd really prefer to stop saying it because I'm making some folks, folks uncomfortable. But, but since you, because you're so beside yourself that I dare say something like that, little pope, little pope, little pope, little pope, little pope. So did, have we got that settled yet? Okay, all right. If you're the Lord over your church, you know, you are it. There is no other. You Look up the word pope and tell me that you're not a little pope. Okay, just a little pope, not as big a pope, not as big a pope as you think you are. Just a little pope. Uh -uh. 
Now, if you have your people start calling you father, we know you're in trouble. Well, you don't, maybe you don't yet let them call you father, but you let them treat you like you're their father. Hello? Which one of these cameras is working? I'm going to look at you in the eyeball. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You're not their father. Because shepherds can't be the father of sheep. Sheep father sheep. Shepherds don't father sheep. Praise God. And you don't want to take the position that you're the father of the sheep because that makes you a bad person. We, we could get some stones out and work you over for your bestiality if you're the father of your sheep. I really wish you'd leave me alone so I could go on. I'm not being facetious, and this isn't a put-on. But thankfully, I'm not your God nor your judge, so praise God. I said what he gave me to say. Now I will go on. Okay. Why sittest thou alone, thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning until evening? And Moses, Moses said to his father-in-law, he was so impressed with himself because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and of his laws. Hmm. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, just in case you didn't get it the first time, the thing that thou doest is what? What's it say? I mean, maybe you have a different Bible than I do. This is, this is Exodus 18, verse 17. Moses' father-in-law said unto him, You know this man's got to be of God because it's his father-in-law talking to him. And he took it. I was trying to be funny with that one. Okay, sorry. Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee for this thing is too heavy for thee thou art not able to perform it thyself alone now what I'd like to know is all these books that talk about ministerial burnout does any of them cover this no they don't no they don't and if they're not covering this, they're not worth the paper they're written on. Because this is God covering ministerial burnout before it was ever even considered to be a problem. Because Moses is the first guy leading God's first congregation. And this is in the beginning of his leadership. And Jethro, his father-in-law, the prophet, says to him, what you're doing is not good. You're going to wear yourself out. Hmm. Don't you just love the word? I love the word. I love the word. It's got the answers. The word's got the answers. Verse 18, thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. That's a pretty affirmative statement, isn't it? Pretty assertive statement. Be thou for the people to Godward, and thou mayest that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. Thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. And the what? We're good at teaching people the way to walk. We're not too good at teaching them the work they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them 
to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Now, I'm assuming this one reason why that uh, Pastor David right here at Antioch Central uses the terminology of his small group leaders as deacons. Because the description of these people here is very, very close to the description of the qualifications of deacons in Acts 6. So, we're going to place these able men who fear God. They're men of truth. They hate covetousness. You can't bribe them to get your way. And place them over them, over the people. To be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. Ten what? Ten families. Because again, he's talking about this mass of 600,000 soldiers. And he just not only gave them structure for the, the body, but structure for the army. Same structure. So the, the, the least, in principle, the least uh, responsibility of any of these men was uh, ten families. Now, I'm supposed to be a mathematician. Let's see how easy I can do this. So, so if you've got 600,000 and there's captains of tens, now you've got 60,000 leaders that are captains of ten, right? And you've got to add to that more uh, 3,000? Yeah, 3,000 captains of 50. No, 12,000 captains of 50. Yeah. So that's uh, 72,000. And then you add 600 captains of or 6,000 captains of 10, so that's 78,000. And if I'm not doing this right, you're welcome to tell me it's not. 78,000, and then you add 6,000 captains of thousands. So I messed this up somewhere in there. It's 600,000 captains of 10s. Whatever, you get the idea. I worked this out before, but my brain is not working right the second. Used to be able to do all this in my head, but the brain's had too much practice at that, and it's tired. (laughs) So anyway, somebody's figured it up. How many is it? So add this up for me. 600,000 captains of, not 600,000, 60,000 captains of 10 and then of captains of 50 you would have 12 there you go yeah 12,000 and then captains of 100 you got 6,000 right and captains of 1,000 you've got 600 so what is that total Who got the number first? Sixty thousand captains of ten, twelve thousand captains of fifty, six thousand captains of one hundred, and six hundred captains of one thousand is what? So rather than one man carrying the burden. You've now got 78,600 people in Israel carrying the burden. I would call that spreading the the load out, wouldn't you? You know, Moses was demonstrating, and then Jethro came back with two different leadership patterns. Moses' leadership pattern was an inverted pyramid. Where everything sat on the one point of him. 
Everything went up from him, proceeded out from him, and the entire weight of the pyramid sat on him as the one point. But the plan that Jethro commanded him, that, and he said it was from God, was an up, upright pyramid, and that all the weight was spread out over 78,600, correct? 78,600? That's quite a diversification of, of weight. Now, you take a pinpoint, all right? It's just, I'm not, I could do this if I was sitting down, but I, I'm, not, I'm not doing it in my head very well right now. If I've got a, if I've got a pyramid that weighs 10 pounds, And it is one foot on each side. Every dimension is the same, and it's one foot, and it weighs 10 pounds. And I turn that pyramid over on the point, and that point is, let's just say, less than one one hundredth of an inch of a square inch. Do you know what that weight of that one pound pyramid would be on that? The effective weight would be in the hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of pounds of pressure on that one point. But you flip that pyramid over, divide that one pound, divide that that square of one square foot by 78,600 pieces. And then calculate how much of that pound is being held up by each square or each portion of that 78,600. And it's hardly no burden at all. And God said, I'm big picture here. God said to Moses, and I'm giving you a, Interpretation, in my opinion. A paraphrase. He said, your calling is to be looking out there, listening to me, letting me show you what I'm doing, where I'm going, and you letting me tell you how to prepare these people to get there, what to do when they get there. Your responsibility is everybody collectively. I want to give you 78,600 to share the, the load of the individuals. And I'll tell you this right now. I've been in the, officially, according to UPCI, I've been officially in the ministry for 55 years. This coming Monday. Monday, I think it's the 5th, right? What day is the 5th? Monday. I would the the Florida District Board started the clock of my six months of mint of necessary to get your local license. They started the clock for me on Monday. June or on June the 5th, 1968, which that year was a Wednesday. So this coming Monday, that will have been 55 years ago. Yes, and if you're paying attention, I met my wife two days after I graduated, which is Wednesday the 7th. So in 55 years, and spending 35 of those years as a pastor, Especially those that first 20 years of the 35. Or actually the first 13 of the 35 before the Lord gave me this revelation in 83. Actually late 82. We didn't implement it till 83. The weight was just, God have mercy. It was just brutal. Because everything was my responsibility. Everything was my job. Everything. 
and it seems so holy. It seems so righteous. It seems so noble that I'm carrying the whole load. It seems so prideful. It seems so distrusting. It seems so arrogant that I was carrying and disobedient and stubborn that I was carrying the whole load. To me, I was, a, I was just being so sacrificial. I was just I was impressing God with how much I was doing it all. And I had an audience to watch me do it all. And it was so hurtful for him to say, what are you doing? Well, I'm pleasing you by making sure all of this gets done. He said, no, you're not. I'm not pleased at all. I never told you to do it all. I never told you to carry all this. Where'd you get that from? Uh, tradition. Well, he had a solution. And I remind you, please, this was God's first congregation. He didn't have to have this structure in families. It was mother, father. Jacob had uh, two wives and two concubines. Each one of them took care of their kids. It was all structured out. Everybody understood. This is dad. This is mom. This is kids. Okay. Got it. You don't have to give a structure to that. It's just biologically the case. But now you've got a congregation. And he had to structure it for them to have any chance of obeying God. You can call this whatever you want. I don't really care. He, he didn't specify what to call it. But when you consider this is God's first congregation, and that he gave this revelation to Moses two whole chapters before he even gave the law in Exodus 20, how significant is this structure to God that he gave this revelation to Moses for structuring this congregation two whole chapters before the law? And we don't get that? We don't think this is important? Oh, and by the way, none of those people were in the ministry. None of those people were in the ministry. Let me finish reading and I'll get to that. Verse 17, again, I'm going to read quickly. Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel. And God shall be with thee. Be thou to the people for God. To, be thou for the people to Godward. That thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws. And show, shalt show them the way wherein they must walk. And the work that they must do. That way wherein they was, must walk wasn't talking about lifestyle. It was talking about direction for life. Where, where were they going? Verse 21, moreover thou shalt provide out of all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifty, fifties and rulers of tens. Let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter that they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou do this thing, <clears throat> is everybody reading? <clears throat> Everybody see what scripture says? 
What's it say? And God do what? God what? Okay, so Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And from the chief cornerstone, the foundation is the apostles, the prophets. And in this case, the Bible calls Jethro a prophet. And this is what the prophet said. And the prophet just did just prophesy to some guy on the street. This is the specific man that God chose to be the leader of his congregation. And the prophet prophesied and said, And God command thee so. Then shalt thou be able to endure, and this people shall also go to their place in peace. Now, I'm not going to take the time to read it, but you'll find that this was a similar situation the apostles found themselves in. They had had so much revival, and they were all ages, and now they've got a bunch of widow women, some Jews, some not, that the church is trying to minister to. And who's handling the business? The the apostles. There were 12 popes. They're handling it all themselves. And I don't know who it was, but one of them says, what are we doing? We're so busy with this waiting on table stuff that's important. The word of God says for us to take care of the widows. But we don't have time for prayer. We don't have time to study the word. We don't have time to prepare to be be able to minister. This is not good. The thing we do is not good. Let's let's choose some. (laughs) Wherefore, brethren, this is Acts 6. Uh, I'll just read it, verse 1, quickly. And in those days when the uh, number of the disciples was... uh, was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you, look out, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenes. You can see how often I read this one out loud. Uh, (laughs) Parmenes, or whatever his name, and Nicholas, a a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed for them, they laid hands on them to wait on tables. Not to wait on tables. The word, the Greek word describing their ministry is uh, transliterated as deacon. The Greek word is diaconate. And when they had done this, verse 7 says, And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. Why? There's a, finally a discussion in our movement about the fivefold ministry. And uh, I, all the men on that committee are, are friends of mine, brothers. I love them all. But there is constraint. And I understand the reasons for the constraint. I don't agree with them, but I understand them. And since I'm not a part of the committee anymore, I, God bless them. But the bottom line is this. One of the reasons we have little popes is because we've completely denied the Bible on the fivefold ministry. There is no way you read these verses and others like them and promote one of the five to the supreme position. But our culture has. Our culture has. And and how do we fix that? <laughs> Let me tell you what, I got faith for a lot of things. I don't have faith for that. Because that would mean that all of our 
brethren who are the lords over God's heritage because they are supreme and answer to nobody. Now, it's not all of them, but it used to be essentially all of them, and now a lot of don't do it like that anymore, thank God. But you'd have to get all those guys to agree that they're no longer sovereign in their congregations. I'm sorry. I've dealt with humanity for 55 years. And there's just a lot of folks that ain't going there. And that's between them and God. It's not me. I, I don't have responsibility for them. I don't. Thank God. I don't mean that terribly. I don't. Now, the people I've got responsibility for have already moved out of that model. They're not doing that anymore. So, praise God for them. But there's a lot. They're willing to go so far. You know, I've had some of the guys that uh, have asked me to be their oversight say to me, guys have come to me and said, come to them and said, you mean, you mean, you're giving one man the authority to say whatever he wants to say and you've got to do it? No way. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, oh, oh. But you claim to be the one man over a whole group of people that has the authority to say whatever you want to say and expect all of them to do it. Seriously? Really? Really? You don't see the inconsistency of that? You don't see the absolute lack of integrity in that? So you're willing to require of others what you're not willing to submit to? And you, you actually can say that with a straight face? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the time they do. Well, no, no sweat. That's between you and God. It's not between me and you. When I've said what I've been told to say, I'm clear. I mean it sincerely. If I don't have oversight responsibility for you, when I've said whatever God tells me to say, I am clear. The old timers used the phrase out of scripture, after out of scriptural context. When somebody really, really passionately preached, they said, Well, he delivered his soul tonight. That's not what that phrase means. Read it. Scripture says that if he tells you to warn, and you warned, and they don't listen. They're going to be held accountable for that warning, but you've delivered your soul. So when God tells me to say something, I say it. I don't have to convince anybody of it. All I have to do is say it. And I've delivered my soul. My responsibility is done. My responsibility is to God to say what he wants me to say. Now, to those who have asked me to be their covering and the Lord's told me to accept that responsibility, that's different. But there was no stipulation made on who could watch this, participate in this seminar. So there are a significant number of people signed on today or, and or will watch this later. I don't have any accountability for you other than just speak what God gives me. You owe me nothing. Nothing. What you do with what you hear, between you and God. So, the purpose of the fivefold ministry is this. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For the King James says, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into unity of, fa of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, before I read these two 
I have two translations of verse 12 for you to see or hear before I read them. I want you to notice, please, biblically there is no way for there to be unity that God labels as unity from his perspective except that all five of the giftings operate and function as he willed because that's how we get to the unity of the faith. When one of the five is made preeminent and supreme over all five, and the one has the right and authority to not let any of the other four participate with the flock that they are responsible for, then there's not going to be unity. And because that act is sowing the seed of disunity just by not being willing to be who you are as one of the five, you're going to reap disunity from your own congregation. You can't preach to your people to submit to you while you would submit to no one without sowing a seed of rebellion. And you're going to reap that rebellion. When a husband won't submit to the authority over them spiritually, they sow the seed of rebellion in their marriage. And you can tell your wife to be submitted all you want. But that's on you because you've set an example of not submitting. Oh, my. The Lord said this to me a month or so ago. I don't remember exactly when. And I thought I was never going to have to say it. And here it is. Ephesians, we'll talk about submission here a minute. Ephesians chapter 5, please. Uh, let's try verse 14, see where I am. Uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. 20, 21, okay, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Next verse, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands and as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Listen now. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. So is submission qualified? That means it's not blanket. Is, submission, is the wife's responsibility to submit to the husband qualified? Yes, it is right here. She is to submit to him as he, go back to the previous word, verse, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. <laughs> so a wife is supposed to give herself, submit to a husband that has given himself to the good of her and the family, not serving his own selfish interests. And as much as he has a right to say to her, you need to submit to me, she has a right to say, just as soon as you start treating us like Christ treated the church. Ooh. What does this button do? <laughs> oh, no. Why are you supposed to be submit to her husband? Period. In the story, really. And I've had preachers tell me that, and heard them preach, that a saved wife has to submit to an unsaved husband, even if he tells her to stay home from church and not obey God. 
Wait, wait. Her submission in the book is qualified. It's not blanket. It's not just blank check. The wife submits to her husband as he is like Christ in giving himself to her benefit like Christ did to the church. Now, if you read that with uh, objectivity, that's exactly what it says. Now, if you have an agenda as a man or agenda as a woman, you won't read it objectively. You're going to read it however it suits you best, which is what a lot of people do with Scripture. So that's enough of that. All right. So here's what Ephesians 4.12 says in the Amplified. Here's the purpose of the fivefold ministry. His intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints. His consecrated people that they should do the work of ministering toward building up Christ's body, the church. Which the expanded translation says this. For the equipping of the saints for ministering work with a view to the building up of the body of Christ. Now, when Moses needed leadership from the people, he took the leadership from among the people. That's what it says specifically. I'm not going there right now, but if you go to Numbers 11, when Moses said he needed help and God wanted to give him 70 to help him, he took the 70 elders from among the elders. Read it. That's exactly what it says. He took these leaders in Exodus 18 from the people. He but God later took the 70 elders from among the elders of Israel, meaning there was a whole lot more elders in Israel than those 70. Now, uh, let me tell you what my ultimate goal here is, that you will care enough about this that after Monday evening, you will go on the website, you will get the set of notes, and then you'll go through it. Step, it's, it's, they're notes. They're not prose. It's not a book. It's uh, Roman numerals, capital letters, numbers, little numbers. It's easy to follow. It's not everything. Not everything is explained, but it's there enough if you want to follow it that you can get this. Why? Because if we... It, We've got to get this. we just got to get this. Because let me tell you something right now. Two things, two crises I talked about last night. The crisis of growth, because growth causes a crisis. Let me tell you something right now. You could, when, we, when we had our first child, we were excited to have that child, but it was a crisis. Because it changed everything. And we had, to, we had to change everything we did, all of our way of doing business, all the way we, 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 we conducted ourselves as a couple. <coughs> we weren't two anymore. We're now three. That's a crisis. And you have to adjust to the crisis. It may be a good crisis, but it's still a crisis. It brings stress. It brings pressure. Growth produces crisis. And so the Bible talks about all this, you know, growth produces crisis. But then also there is the other kind of crisis, crisis of sickness, crisis of natural calamities, financial crisis, you name. All of those things are crisis. So God led his people. I think we came up with a number 78,600 total of those that were captains of thousands, captains of hundreds, captains of 50, captains of 10, of 600,000 people in Israel's army. Okay? But when he wanted elders, he picked 70 elders from among the elders in Israel. And he, and he ordained them in this sense. The Bible says he took, God took the spirit that was upon Moses and put it on the 70. No, God put his spirit. No, it doesn't say that. The manifestation of the spirit of God that ministered through Moses, God took 
that manifestation of ministry, that spirit of ministry that was on Moses, he put it on the 70. That's the only way all 72 of them, counting Moses and Aaron, could have ministered in unity. None of them said and lived to tell it, well, we're just going to do our own thing here. This was such a powerful experience that two of the 70 that didn't show up for this transaction It actually happened to them wherever they were in the camp. All of this stuff is significance. (laughs) Oh, oh, the verse that just blows my mind up. The last verse of John. John 21, 25. There are many other things which Jesus did and said, the which if they should be written every one I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So if the ground is the bottom floor of the library, and the gravitational forces of the earth or the ceiling of that library, it would not be able to contain all the books that would have to be written about everything that Jesus did and said. Now, that being the case... That God has condensed all of that down to this little book that we can hold in our hand that can be printed small enough you can fit it in a shirt pocket, carry it around in a purse, and we're going to dismiss parts of that as unimportant? (laughs) Seriously? Or some are going to dismiss the entire Old Testament? I had a question. Which holy books did Abraham have to read to find out about God? Anybody? Everything Abraham knew about God was by the direct communication of the voice of God to Abraham. He had nothing to read. What was the Bible for the apostles? What was the Bible they quoted? What we call the Old Testament. It was the only Bible they had. So we're going to dismiss the only Bible? When Jesus said, the law and the prophets bring us unto Christ. Or was that Paul that said that? But the law and the prophets bring us unto Christ. He didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law. He's the one that opened their understanding so they could understand the scriptures. Luke 24. What scriptures? He didn't say to them, okay, boys, I'm about to leave here. You can throw the Old Testament away. It doesn't mean anything anymore. No. He opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. What God was going to do spiritually in the New Testament He did in invisible form in the Old Testament. That's why Hebrews 9 and 10 specifically talk about all of that being a pattern. It's all a pattern that we're supposed to follow. It's a pattern of heavenly things. Shine on the earth as a shadow. The shadow is not the real thing. The light shines on the real thing in heaven. And the shadow on the earth is the indicator of what's coming. And when I don't take these things in the Old Testament literally and understand they all apply to the church of the living God, I'm denying the only Bible the apostles had. And again, going back to the law of first mention. First mention of a congregation, the first mention of a structure for that congregation. There it is. <laughs> One more time. God gave the revelation of the structure of how to incorporate the people being trained to lead the people under the oversight of the elders. 
He gave that two chapters before the law. Why isn't that taught far and wide? Why is it that believed by us? Because all of us, not all, but most of us, were either raised in the church or we came out of other types of churches that were practicing some form of this. And all we did was adjust and adapt that to fit the culture we were raised in one way or the other. We didn't go back to the book to start over from scratch to find out what he actually said. So what does that mean we have to do? We have to, begin to, we have to be willing to adjust when he teaches us understanding, Isaiah 28, line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. We have to be willing to do that. We have to be willing to do that, which requires what? Change. And, of course, if you're not changing, you're dying. I don't even remember this. I really don't. I don't, I don't remember this. But I found this. Um, oh, come on now. I thought it was right here. I wanted to read it. I found this on a, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it's a. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> I can't believe that. What did I do with it? That's pretty sad. Anyway, I, I'm not going to quote it very well, but it, it said something along this line. According to biology, if you're not changing, you're not growing, you're dying. The evidence, the evidence biologically that you're dying is you stop changing. You degenerate, but that's not changing everything that's alive changes positively it's a continual process of change and again maturity is a process that's the definition of the word for spiritual maturity it's a process it's a process and we must submit ourselves to the process and we must lead those that will submit themselves to the process now this uh, and, and I knew when he gave me direction to at least basically refer to these notes that I my humanity was going to be frustrated because I was not going to be able to cover all that, okay? So I had to give all that to God in advance, and I'm trying to give it back to him right now because there's a whole lot more I want to cover in here, and uh, I'm willing. Uh, the flesh is weak, <laughs> uh, literally weak. With all I've gone through in the last year and a half, I don't have the stamina I used to have. And so even sitting down, I am running out of steam. And since the Lord's the one that laid me down, he knew all about that. Okay? So the point again is, if you are truly open to God and his word, what you're going to do is you're going to Get this set of notes and take your time and work through them. And you're going to prove what's in the book. And you're going to prove what of the notes is not in the book. I hope you do. I hope you make that effort. If I can't get you to go in there to find out it's in the book, I'd love for you to go in there to try to prove it's not in there. Love for you to. I'll take either motive just as long as you, you, you consider what the notes say 
and find out whether or not the Bible is saying that. I'll take it. Praise God. Um, my part tonight, tomorrow, tomorrow night, and Saturday is uh, relatively minor by the will of God. I am looking forward to hearing my three brethren, uh, spiritual brethren, minister. What? And I, I want to hear what they got to say. I trust them because God put them in this place, and I trust them to hear from God, and I trust what they're doing. Uh, we're all learning. We're all growing. We're all in the process. But uh, the Lord's using them, and we're all gaining from what he said. Amen. And so there's a whole lot more in here. I discuss uh, a body. Where does, where does life take place in the body? Well, my arm's not alive. My head's not alive. My leg's not alive. Life takes place on the level of the cell. That's where life takes place. And those collective cells living and functioning allows parts of my body, which we call members, to function. And, and life and ministry to the body takes place on the level of the cell. So as the heart pumps the blood through the lungs, it picks up oxygen. And as the blood goes through the intestine, it picks up fuel. And the blood takes all of that down all the way from the arteries to the capillaries to where they end at each individual cell. Every single cell has its own blood supply. And the blood brings to that cell life, oxygen, and fuel. But then when the, cell, the blood is leaving the cell, it brings all the waste products of life. And it brings it back to the capillaries, and the capillaries collect it, takes it to the veins, and takes it back then to the intestines or the lungs to be expelled as carbon dioxide or from the intestines to be expelled as processed fuel. Who designed that system? God. Nothing God designed is without its spiritual application and purpose. Nothing. And if I'm going to believe God and follow his word, then part of my challenge is to take the natural things that God created that he refers to and then understand how they apply in the spiritual realm to spiritual principles. That's how you know, just for example, that's how you know what is true salvation doctrine and what is not. Any salvation doctrine that does not fit the exact elements of the whole birth process cannot be from God. All the way from conception, which is not salvation, but it, there's life. What is conception? Somebody hears the word and believes it. There's now life. Are they saved? No, but they're on the process of being saved because they now have life. A babe in the womb for nine months, is we don't, we don't count that as, uh, as a fully formed life. But there's life there. There's life there ever since speg, sperm and egg came together. There's life. And that life continues to progress and grow until it reaches the end of the process where the, where the embryo becomes a fetus and is fully formed. Uh, and then, then it's just simply maturing in all of those systems and whatever. And then nearing the time of birth, it re it's usually carried laying on his back or head up in the womb. But nearing birth is the reversal of position where the head drops down in the birth canal because the head's got to come out first or the child will be suff suffocated during the birth process. It's called a breech birth if the head's not coming out first. That is a great emergency. A lot of babies have died because they didn't come out head first. 
So then after the baby drops in the birth canal, at some point, then all the birth process starts, all the labor, and at some point, the head comes out, uh, and then the body comes out, and, and medical science calls that the birth of the water. Separation of the baby from the mother is the birth of the water. And then, of course, the baby uh, is held up usually by the, the ankles upside down while they pat, them, pat the child on the back to clear all the stuff out of the lungs that was there in the, in the womb. And the proof that their lungs are relatively clear is what? The cry. The sound that a newborn makes. And the plan of salvation has to fit in principle every single part of that or it's not the plan of salvation. So for those that don't believe, that those that are sitting out here that don't believe all of our doctrine, don't know anything about God, they're wrong. Are they saved? No more than a baby in the womb is born. But while the baby's not born yet, you can't deny there's life there. And that started at what? Conception. Because conception and birth are not synonymous. Yet there are a lot of people that believe that you're saved immediately at faith and they make that the new birth. That's absurd. There's a lot of ladies that wish that's the way it was. You go from conception to birth. Boy, that was easy. No, it's not easy. The reversal of the position is what? Repentance. The baby coming out of the mother is the baptism of water. So it's, natural, it's spiritual baptism in water in the name of Jesus. Because the baby, whether it breathes or not, if it comes out of the mother, except as a, uh, uh, I guess, technically a uh, miscarried fetus, they're given the family name. I've done two funerals in my time here for stillborn babies. One on the gravestone, they put the, put the name they intended to name that child. The other had a gravestone that said baby, whatever the family name was. They got the family name at birth whether they breathed or not. But then, of course, if they're breathing, which being born doesn't do you much good if you're not breathing. If you're breathing, then you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and now you've got to start on life. And any plan of salvation preached or taught by anybody that doesn't meet all of those criteria as specified by Jesus is a false doctrine. And everything has got Jesus' signature on it. God, well, Jesus is the creator, right? Uh, everything has got his signature on it as the, the creator is intended to be a, an example of spiritual things. That's what the Lord Jesus said to uh, Nicodemus. He says, how can I be born when I'm, when I'm old? Can I enter my mother's when the second time be born. Jesus said, if I'm talking to you about natural things, earthly things, and you don't understand them, how are you going to understand if I begin to tell you about spiritual things? And what were those spiritual things? Some of the most abused verses in the entire Bible. For God, the spiritual thing is this. This doesn't tell us how to be saved. This is God's perspective from heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The application of that verse is, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever that turns out to be in application, that was prophetic. Whatever that, that, that prophecy turns out to be in application, that's natural things. That's, that's the earthly thing. He told us the heavenly thing that the light shined down on and cast shadow on. In John 3, 16. And I mean, it goes back to that thing again. All right, all over again. <laughs> Hebrews 9 says that a testament is not enforced until after the death of the testator. 
and people want to make Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John New Testament books when Jesus didn't die till the end of each one of those books. And since the testament cannot be in effect till after the death of the testator, and Jesus did not die, the man Christ Jesus did not die till the end of those four gospels, those four gospels cannot be considered New Testament books. They are foundational books of our faith because of Jesus' living his life here. They're also uh, transitional books between the Old and New Testament. They are not New Testament books. I'm not, I'm not devaluing them. They're very valuable. They give us the most information we can have, direct information about Christ and his character and his priorities, his whatever. But they're not New Testament books because Jesus spoke those things alive and the New Testament couldn't begin till he was dead. Praise God. So, Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for every person that has invested the time in listening to this so far today. And in Jesus' name, I speak the word of authority that an angelic hedge would have been be put around our hearts that the adversary cannot steal this seed out before you're able to make this seed germinate, grow, and produce fruit to your kingdom. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let your reign, the reign of your spiritual blessings and the, the light of your son of the, coming from the word of God shine upon that, that seed until it germinates and produces that which is pleasing to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for all of this. Amen.